in uh, elementary school, I was introduced to the zany, magical wonder of Rube Goldberg machines. Does anybody remember Rube Goldberg machines? Those intricate machines of cause and effect that produces some kind of rather simple result. And it seems like it's much more complicated than it should be, but it's much more fun, like wiping your face or getting the TV to turn on. I always remember the game Mousetrap, and that was the, the very simple Rube Goldberg machine. Now, when I looked at those, I always liked to start at the end, the result, and work back to see what caused the toast to cook, the egg to fry, or the television to turn on. It's sometimes enlightening to look at the beginning in light of the end. You know, the church is a bit like a Rube Goldberg machine. It's a series of twisty, turny, unexpected people and events, councils and circumstances that have led to what we call church today. That's kind of interesting to look back over the span of history and restack the dominoes and see all the cause and effect in, in light of the creation of what we call church. What event started this machine that ends with the church? And so we'll read Matthew 28, 16 through 20, what you just kind of heard with the children. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority on heaven and on earth has been given unto me. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. That's the way the church started. This is the finger pushing the first domino. The risen Christ on an unnamed mountain in the north of Israel met with the eleven disciples. If you remember, there's no longer twelve. Judas is gone. He was unhappy or, or proud or scared or just contrary. But he betrayed Jesus. When you have a, a big group, there's always going to be a few that don't like the way things are going. Don't like what their role is. Jesus had that problem with the disciples before the church. And here we are. I guess we don't have all the bugs worked out of the machine. So now there are 11, and Matthew tells us that when they met with the risen Christ, they worshipped Him. Now the translation we read said that, but some doubted. Actually, literally it says, and they worshipped Him, and they doubted. Does that go together? Worship and doubt? I think it does. I've never met in my life anyone with 100% faith, clean without a shadow of doubt. I've, I've run across people who claim to have that. When you dig a little deeper, you see that the faith has very weak roots. It's a house of cards waiting for the slightest breeze or jolt. Nobody has faith like high noon. We all have haunting questions. Why her? Why us? Why that? Why now? What about how did... They worshipped and they doubted. Don't feel bad toward them or bad toward yourself when you have that same mixture. Presbyterian minister and novelist George MacDonald said, With all sorts of doubts I am familiar. And the result of them is, has been and will be a widening of my heart and soul and mind to greater glories of the truth. I cannot say I never doubt, nor until I hold the very heart of good as my very own in Him can I wish not to doubt. For doubt is the hammer that breaks the windows clouded with human fancies and lets in the pure light. Doubt is part of faith and will be until what is unseen is completely revealed and we behold Christ in all His glory with our own eyes. We worship and we doubt but we continue to worship. That's faith. And, and Jesus said, I have been given from God all authority on heaven and on earth to give you these instructions. I want you to go into the whole world and make disciples. 
Now some people misread that word make as though Jesus is commanding his followers to coerce people into becoming disciples. Like you better be a disciple or else I have this big stick. In the early days of Christianity, people were offered the choice of conversion or death. Whole nations, tribes of people, they made disciples. Native peoples in South America were put into forced labor camps so they would have the opportunity to hear the good news and be made into disciples. That happened here with Native Americans. Children taken from parents and put into schools. Horrible schools so they could be made into disciples. Well, that's not exactly what Jesus meant. Make disciples simply means disciple everybody. That's what Jesus did. He loved them, He blessed them, He helped them, and some of them did not care. Have you ever had that experience? You help, you work with, you want to help somebody, and they don't care. But you don't get huffy and mad and threaten to invade their towns and pillage and burn or tell them, well, I hope you like heat because it's going to be hot where you're going. <laughs> That's not what we do. You see, there was, there was a rich young man. He made a fortune with the internet business, a startup company. Got rich overnight. And he came in some anguish to Jesus and he said, Jesus, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus looked at him and he loved him and said, your, your life is just absolutely cluttered. You've got too much stuff. Just, just give it away to poor people and then come and follow me. The man became sad and said, I can't. I just have to have it all. Jesus gave him room to say no. Because if you don't have room to say no, Yes doesn't mean a thing. There's no coercion. There have been times and places when and where people have been emotionally coerced, socially coerced, and even militantly coerced into following Jesus. I think of that poor family, a Jewish couple in, in Germany, living among a bunch of Protestant Christian neighbors. They couldn't find work as much as they tried. They said, we're, we're qualified, we're clerks, we can work for the court, we can work for a business, we have our credentials. Why were they having so much trouble finding a job? Because they weren't in the church. They were Jewish. And so that couple, to avoid starving to death, Submitted to the baptism of a local church. They were made into disciples. But, but they had a son. Carl. Karl Marx. Who was so incensed that a church would do that. He became a huge enemy of all that we love. All because somebody misunderstood what it means to make disciples. When Jesus went through a certain village, a preaching and blessing, but the village did not believe, the disciples were so mad and said, Jesus, these people aren't even listening to you. Do you want us to call down fire from heaven and destroy them? i got a drone in the air right now. I can hit a button. <laughs> and Jesus said, leave them alone. We'll go somewhere else. And Jesus gave people room. You see, making disciples is done without any kind of pushing and pressuring. It is it's done without holding people emotionally hostage. It, it isn't done by selling fire insurance or scaring people. I have a friend, Davey, who was dating a girl who was really active in a church. And so she invited him on Halloween to go to this thing called Judgment House. Anyone ever heard of a Judgment House? They're, they're scary. So... <laughs> You take this tour of a house and you see why all these different kinds of people are going to burn in the everlasting fires of hell. College professors, oh, they're burning. Women have abortions, oh, you're burning. Men who skip church to go to golf, get ready for a hot time. You think it's hot in summer playing golf. When you go home, look up Judgment House on YouTube. And you will see examples. Sometimes they are complete with flames and pyrotechnics and deep, scary devil voices and screams of torment as the whole soundtrack to the evening. It's quite a production. 
At the end of traveling through this house, there's a table where you can go pray with someone to accept Jesus so what happened to the people in that house won't happen to you. And then at church on Sunday, they advertise how many souls they saved on Halloween night. My friend was dragged to this thing and hasn't gone back to church since. You can't make a disciple. Jesus gave people room. He treated everybody with respect and loved them. He met them wherever they were and cared for them as a, as a whole person, not just a soul to chalk up for God. And He said to His disciples, I, I want you to be this way with everybody in the world. Now I'm sure that shocked some of the disciples. Um, um, Jesus, I, I'm not sure you realize this, but everybody includes a whole lot of people I don't like. Did you, did you realize that, Jesus? And Jesus said, everybody. But we'll have problems if we have everybody. If you say everybody's welcome, then everybody may just come. The loud ones. The obnoxious ones. The challenging ones. The dirty ones. The needy ones. The proud ones. The ones that are Clemson Tiger fans. Everybody. Really, Jesus? <laughs> Jesus said there was a man who sowed some wheat in a, in a field, and one day his servants noticed that there were some weeds growing there. They found their master and said, Sir, there are some weeds in the field. There are weeds in the wheat. Do you want us to go pull them out? The man said, Leave the weeds alone. If you start pulling up the weeds, you'll tear up the wheat. Just leave it alone. At harvest time, there'll be a difference between weeds and wheat, but leave it alone. You just make disciples, and for those who are ready and willing, baptize them. See, this is important. In their relationship to Christ, people start out like a couple in love. Maybe just dating at first, but then becoming engaged. And afterwards, they get married, and they reach a point of saying, I commit myself publicly before God and relatives and friends. I commit myself to this person for as long as we both shall live. And we call that a covenant. Baptism is a public acknowledgement that I want to be numbered among the followers of Jesus. Baptism is, is parents in the church saying, this child is God's child. We want her to know the ending of her life and resurrection right from the beginning. And then Jesus said, I want, I, I want you to teach them. Teach them all that I have commanded you. Now some people are not much into that. They are sort of into having a quick emotional response or, or some kind of sudden experience of God and, and that's the end of it. If you were to die that same day, you'd be in great shape because God's grace can save you in between the bridge and the water. I know it's just that quick. But, but most of us live a long time after baptism. And the question is, how are we to live? What are we to do? We have to have some instruction. What did Jesus say? That's very important to me. Is it important to you? What did Jesus say? I cannot for the life of me think of anyone who's, who's gung-ho in the baptism part, but then is rather careless about trying to find out what Jesus said about this or that. <coughs> I want to be counted among Jesus' followers, but uh, that's all. I don't even know how to know what I'm following, or what it means, what it calls me to do. That's why Sunday school is so important. We, we gather here and we worship and hopefully we learn some, but a Bible study, Sunday school, small group, that's where you learn what this means. This is not just you're forgiven, everything's great now. It's you're a Christian. What does that mean to follow Jesus? Do you know who you're following? Do you know who you're following? See, I think people actually want to know that. They may disguise it, act like they don't, say all kinds of silly things, make some jokes, but I think they really want to know. It's true of young people. I've had many opportunities to go to, to camps for weekends and summers with, with middle school and high school aged youth, to go on, to meetings on Monday or Sunday night. We go through all the fun, the activities, silly games of stuffing marshmallows in your mouth and digging for worms and pies and all that kind of stuff. That's important. But after all of that, almost every time without fail, someone wanted to know something about what Jesus said. 
We'd had the lights turned off, all in our bunks, when the 13-year-old asks, What did Jesus say about drinking? Is it a sin? Why is it wrong? They want to know what Jesus said about it. Or maybe they say, People always tell me that I should follow God's will for my life, but, but how do I know what that is? How can I know? Why do Christians say the exact opposite things sometimes? Which will am I supposed to follow? <coughs> One teenage boy said, My minister said that committing suicide was an unpardonable sin, and, and if you commit suicide, you have to go to hell. What do you think? Did, did Jesus say anything about suicide? Because, because my friend last year, he is he in hell? He was 16 and was asking me what Jesus said about suicide. They are wrong. They are flat wrong. Those who think that all young people want is entertainment. We're sitting around the floor of the cabin talking and someone says, What's heaven like? Will we recognize our grandparents or our friends? Will they recognize us? What do we do in heaven? Do we go there as soon as we're dead? Ten teenage guys in a room on the floor that could be playing cards or running around outside, but instead they're asking about heaven. Jesus said, teach them. Now I know there are a lot of churches these days, very popular churches, some of them just humongous churches whose primary concern is to be consumer conscious, consumer oriented, consumer driven. So many of these churches have quite a variety of talent on display and worship and the crowds are much, much bigger than any of us could ever even imagine. But if you think that is finally and deeply and ultimately what people find interesting, I think we're wrong. What is interesting is what touches my life at its deepest point, whether I'm 6 or 96. If you want to know what's really interesting, what's really interesting, then go to a youth retreat. When all the hot dogs have been eaten and all the games have been played, when it's just about time to settle down for the night, that's when it gets interesting. Somebody blurts out, those kids that shot those other kids... Do you think Jesus still loves them? That's when you know what's really interesting. Who asked that? Fifteen-year-old. And someone says, well, what about people who are born in Muslim countries and learn about that all their lives? I mean, if my parents were Muslim, I'd probably be Muslim too. Would I go to hell? Is it just where you happen to be born and who you happen to be born to? Who asked that? Sixteen-year-old. If you're a Christian and pray to God all the time, then why won't God heal your parents? Thirteen. Teenagers are asking these things. Isn't, isn't it amazing? They, they want to know. I know the Bible says the world was created in seven days, but what about evolution? Is, is the Bible wrong? One of them asked me what Jesus said about premarital sex and how far is too far. What would happen if they did this or that? They weren't even old enough to drive, but they had to deal with these issues, and they want to know what Jesus said about it. That is why Jesus said, I want you to teach them. What I said on all these subjects, just teach them. You can't make them do it, but they want to know. It started with 11 men who were given a charge. 2,000 years later, there's the church, broken and beautiful as it is, how did we get here? Well, if you want the long answer, I can give you a two-year long church history course. I'd love to do that. But you might rather have the short answer. How did we get here? Men and women in every generation decided to do one simple thing. Teach them. Let us pray together.